Okay, so, uh, so my name is uh, Mathieu Livari. I work for uh, Qualcomm. Uh, so the, I, I came with, uh, so the idea was basically that we had this discussion on uh, hardware acceleration offload in the kernel. Uh, and we have, we have actual products today which are um, in production, which are using uh, ac hardware acceleration a lot. So we wanted to come and uh, show uh, what we did uh, and how this product works, maybe. Uh, so I came, uh, my work consists mainly in, uh, I work a lot in OpenWRT, so we have uh, an OpenWRT fork in, uh, in Qualcomm for all the uh, SOC uh, NPUs that we have. Uh, I came with Sol and Ben, so Sol is the, the brain of all this uh, hardware acceleration. So we, the architecture here has been in place for 10 years. Uh, so the, these products are uh, the networking part of Qualcomm, so previously Ateros and Ubicom. Uh, they are mainly designed for uh, home gateways, so it's very different uh, from the kind of products that we've been mostly talking about so far. Uh, the idea is uh, the, these products contain a lot of features uh, on the same hardware, so they, are, they need to be able to handle a lot of traffic for home, so uh, uh, up to a gigabit plus two Wi-Fi. So it's still fairly important, and it has to be done on a pretty small CPU, which drives the need of uh, acceleration. Uh, and still, we need to put in place a lot of firewall rules, uh, sometimes do some uh, deep packet inspection, and uh, a lot of fancy features like that. So the way we design this is uh, a, a flow-based offload. Uh, most of the uh, we most of the decision is actually happening in uh, Linux, and uh, by design we really wanted to for Linux to be the master for any kind of offload. Uh, so uh, we basically try to leverage all the uh, net filter. Uh, whatever decision comes out of uh, Linux, we want to make sure that it goes in the hardware. Uh, the other idea, if we, wa we wanted it to be transparent, uh, without involving any kind of uh, user advanced configuration, uh, same tool, so it's similar to like the idea that was presented previously. And uh, we have to accelerate all kind of protocol, like uh, uh, anything you can find on the home network, which is uh, IP, V4, V6, NAT, uh, PPPoE encapsulation, uh, L2TP, and uh, VLAN, and we also support uh, uh, the hardware can accelerate also QDisks. Uh, another interesting th thing that uh, the hardware is doing is for the statistics, it's slightly different than what uh, was presented for the switch framework as an example, where uh, uh, we don't query the statistics uh, when we actually want to uh, read the statistics. The statistics are automatically reported by the firmware. Uh, and the firmware, uh, the host is then like taking all the statistics and propagating them to the different network devices and contracts and so on. Um, so the front end, the way we design this is because it's an architecture that's been in place for a, a long time. Uh, it's been done in a modular way and we tried not to modify uh, the Linux kernels internal, so we have a separate database uh, which actually sits uh, on the post-routing route, so we register some net filter hooks, it scans the first packet, and once uh, we have a, a parser, which parses it, figures out the operation which has been done in the packet, and uh, installs the flow in the, uh, in the NSS firmware through the NSS driver. Uh, we also interact, uh, so the, the basically the front end is uh, kind of monitoring all these events in the system. Uh, it handles the uh, contract destroy and rules to know when the contract, uh, when the connection is uh, dead. And uh, same thing for bonding and uh, interface uh, events up, down, and so on. 
so the TCP rule creation is like very basic. The NSS Excuse me. Oh. Can you go back a slide? <coughs> so the Linux contract, that's in the stack itself, not in... Yes. So we device. had to... Uh, what we did is we uh, reverted a, a, a mechanism. We actually put a mechanism which was uh, removed in a 2628, I believe, uh, to be notified whenever a contract is uh, deleted uh, or a connection is deleted. So we register into this mechanism, and the contract then get notifies uh, you whenever you delete a connection, so you can then propagate the information to the hardware. Okay, so then on your packets per second, I assume you weren't doing uh, connection turnover. That was all fixed connections? Yes. Uh, okay, you might, you might want to test it, because in, in this model, contract would be the bottleneck if you had a lot of connection turnover. That is true, that is true. So you, I believe you, uh, you pay a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, CPU usage when you add and delete contract, but then all your flows are, uh, all your flows get uh, offloaded anyway. And for this kind of application, which is a home router, you're never going to get a million connection at the, at the same time. You're going to get maybe a uh, hundred, a thousand, something like that, which is a uh, What application? A home router. Okay. So th I mean that yes, but that's the kind of trade-off you can make on this product typically. Uh, so the NSS firmware is very uh, by default. It's very uh, I would say dumb if you don't program it. It's going to forward everything to the host. Uh, the net at the post routing time, the uh, database is going to uh, catch the packets and parse it. If it's a packet or a flow that we want to accelerate, then it's going to program the hardware and uh, put it. Uh, Can I ask really quick uh, how you decide if it should be offloaded to the hardware or not? By default, and, yeah. And then maybe also, do you allow for states where you have not everything that you're doing in software is offloaded to hardware? Because um, I mean, the, the one one model is to just mirror everything, but that's that's not a model that everybody wants to use, right? You, there's a lot of cases where software wants to handle things in some unique way from, from hardware, and so any model we have, I think, needs to support kind of both. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. So I'll help out a little here. I'm Saul Cavi, by the way, and I work for Qualcomm, obviously. Um, the ECM, the connection manager, basically makes the decision by default that it is going to want to accelerate something. It has hooks into it that basically are classifiers that it can do in line in the kernel as well as a netlink out to user space application that would be able to make decisions, right? And we actually have examples of both of those. And then they can essentially delay for a period of time or delay forever, depending on what you're trying to do, whether or not that connection will get accelerated or not. Whether or not something in Linux or in the Linux networking in the kernel or something for whatever reason you decide you don't want to offload and accelerate the connection. And so then, um, then your, your application will then tell Linux to program the flow in the hardware? So the, the way this works is the, did that just turn on? Okay. <laughs> the way this works is the connection manager wants to do the offload until some man of the classifiers say, I've determined we're not offloading this, at which point we give up trying to offload it. So is, is the, the policy then is part of the connection tracker in the kernel or? Sorry, I'm, I'm so this. our view on policy is very interesting. It's been fun to actually listen to the discussion here because from our perspective, our goal is that the NSS firmware and hardware make no policy decisions and we're offloading them to the kernel. And of course the kernel networking guys say, we don't want to make any policy decisions. We're trying to offload that above, above us to the, to the layer right. out in user space. In truth, this is left up to Linux and we have customers that modify the connection manager to yes. add their own things into exactly. it or whatever they want to do. So everyone's writing their own module to implement their policy in the kernel. Ex or, or up into user space. We or actually have examples where people have done it in user and space. And then user space programs the hardware. 
User space does not program the order. Where user, user space says, okay, I'm willing to have you offload this. And the connection manager is the actual thing that, because what we do, which is really interesting from a design perspective, is we wanted Linux to just work. So we actually have to go in and, well, I want, let, let Matthew keep going. Okay. Let us get, get you sure. there and Matthew will actually answer that question. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much how it works. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so for the destroy rule, uh, it's very similar. So at this point, the flow is accelerated. Uh, the NSS firmware, if it sees a TCP packet uh, with the fin flag set, is going to forward it automatically to Linux. Uh, contract will send an event uh, to which we we'll register to, saying that the connection is destroyed, and we propagate that to the kernel, to the uh, firmware, sorry. And, uh, and, and then the, the rule is removed. So this is an example of the kind of API that the firmware expects today. So it's slightly, uh, it's got similarities with the Flow API uh, that John presented, uh, but it's, it's clearly not a pipeline. It's a pipeline with one stage, depends on how you see it. Uh, we basically need five tuples. Uh, if we need, uh, if we want to do like PPP encapsulation, uh, if we want to do any kind of cost or DSCP remarking, then uh, we can specify it also in the message. Same thing for VLAN and can do up to f two VLANs. So, uh, yeah, uh, the we also get similar message to that the firmware is sending to the host, typically to update stats uh, for a certain connection or for uh, a uh, net device. So this is, these are the stats message typically. Uh, the ECM so, uh, is listening for these events and they are coming uh, regularly. It's like, I think every second, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, and there are two kind of message. Uh, on a per device is going to uh, uh, update all the device counter, like Ethernet, PPP. Uh, and for the contract, then it's going to update the contract, obviously. Uh, part of the modifications we had to do for that is we had to modify pretty much every protocol, uh, every encapsulation layer, like PPP layer, L2TP layer, so that it exposes interface to be able to update stats from an external uh, module. And uh, yeah, last but not least, we have, uh, we the hardware can also do like QDisk acceleration, so uh, with similar uh, uh, QDisk than what is in the kernel. So pretty much the, the way it's implemented is, uh, it's basically we try to get the same behavior of the uh, QDisk uh, in TC, so same command, same syntax, just adding the uh, NSS prefix to the QDisk. Uh, and, uh, and basically if you do that, then uh, we have a, a separate uh, a module which will take care of it and program the hardware ac accordingly. So Linux will be pretty much path through and uh, uh, all the uh, QDisk will happen in, uh, all the uh, policy and uh, scheduling will happen in the, in the firmware. Yep. Any question? Oh. So do you want to add uh, something? Uh, anybody? <laughs> I just, it seems like we want to not embed the decision to always offload, sometimes offload, and, you know, I have this policy into the kernel. Um, and if you don't do that, then it sounds like you need user space to tell you when to program flows into the kernel, or into the, into the hardware. And I'm, I'm just trying to merge these two together. So let me actually introduce Ben Menchaca, who's from the group that actually d uses the same technology but from user space, and have him talk some of how that sort of classification works. 
Yeah, so f first I think I would disagree a little bit with saying that it's, it's done by the kernel. Um, it, it's done by the kernel in the same way that uh, contract creates connections, right? That's something that contract does that's inside the kernel that's done by the kernel, but that doesn't mean that it's making policy decisions. So the policy decisions are all made by sensors or detectors that plug into ECM, right? Which could be, in our case, for example, it's something that runs in the user space, listens to libpcap, you know, statistically sampling connections, makes decisions based on what the flow is, whether or not to accelerate it. If it's BitTorrent, maybe we want to accelerate it. If it's an HTTP flow, maybe we want to do parental controls, something like that, and we don't want to accelerate it, right? So. Uh, all all the, the module is doing is just telling ECM the detector said yes or the detector said no. There may be 10 of these detectors that register and all of them have to say yes or one of them has to say no for it to make a policy decision. And the detectors are in user space or? Some of them are in user space, some of them are in kernel space, um, different people. So, you know, different third party vendors may have already had their, for example, a uh, virus detection or whatever it is. They may have had it as a kernel module. The API is both a kernel API and then there's a Netlink API to user space. So I think we're constantly having this discussion about, uh, so going back to the L3 forwarding example, uh, in order to make IP route add commands behave transparently with a switch, there's a certain minimal amount of policy necessary to realize that end result. And that's, this is kind of like another instance of that decision-making process. And uh, it's, we're always playing around where to, where to put this line, and I, I know that's what you're really concerned about. I think one of the differences in this case is that it's actually just flow offloading for individual flows and it's completely transparent. So it actually doesn't matter so much because of the transparency. I mean, they're supporting basically all the features. They're not, for user space, they're supporting the regular commands. They are um, supporting, let's say, using bonding, whatever, all the features you can use. So basically from the user, uh, user space perspective, it's completely transparent. It basically doesn't exist. So um, it really doesn't matter if you have a policy decision in the kernel or not. I mean, which they don't in the strict sense, um, but it really doesn't matter actually, I think. So one of the things that we've done that I think is interesting, which ultimately is interesting in terms of this meeting, is that um, Matthew talked about sort of what I call the touch points, which are places in the Linux kernel where today we either need information which we have trouble getting and therefore had to add an API, or we want to give information, i.e. typically statistics, that we have, that, that there's no concept in the Linux kernel for updating. And I think that one of the goals that we had was to make those touch points, um, since we've now gone through eight kernel versions, I don't know, some number of kernel versions, the goal clearly with that is to make those as light as possible. And so one area, of course, that would help a great deal is to work through how we would get those into the upstream community so that we don't have to keep, um, you know, essentially doing this each release and rather have them as part of how the native networking subsystems work. So that's an area where our, I'm actually interested in working with the upstream community. I'd like to never support a touch point, so to speak, right? Okay, hey, some of, someone from this side. <laughs> I actually, I actually, my, that side. I actually circumvented the system because normally I'm on that side. <laughs> so, I, I, I think I'm, I'm agreeing with Patrick. I'm wondering though if that ECM module could be generalized so other people could use it. So I definitely think the answer is yes. Uh, I also think at the same time it could probably be minimized. A lot of the reason that we maintain ECM is because of, because of the patch sets that we currently choose to carry, right? So uh, a lot of that data could, uh, so as, as an example, with every connection, uh, currently we carry um, statistics in our database 
uh, that, you know, that came from our firmware, and then we update the contract database. Well, if we had a hook directly in contract that would, if a connection is marked as offloaded, would go query a net device that we specify for stats, or would query another table for stats, we wouldn't have to maintain that in our database. There's a list of those. If we eliminate all of them, we don't need ECM at all. So that's, uh, there's, there's two halves to that question, I guess. You still, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, so you, ultimately, the, you have to have something which is a policy-based decision that says to accelerate or not to accelerate, right? If you're going to do DPI and you're doing that on the main CPU and you want to look at every packet, you can't then at the same time decide to offload it. So something, right, some piece of logic, right, and I personally don't want us carrying that logic. I'd much prefer that logic be carried within Linux. The ECM is serving that purpose today. The other thing we forgot to say is the, uh, actually most of it is, uh, it's not upstream, but it's uh, open source, so it's accessible on uh, codeora.org, which is the, the website uh, that Qualcomm uses to push well, code. It's, it's open sourced, but not upstream, so it's all available on Code Aurora. Well, we talked previously about um, the design concept, well, privately. And from my opinion, for this kind of device, it's pretty much what I would have done. It's pretty close to what I think is the correct way to do that, except the post-routing hook. In uh, my opinion, it belongs into the device, um, where you actually don't have to try to figure out how the packet got there. You simply know it got there. And at that point, you don't have to do any analysis of routes, of um, bonding or whatever, you simply know the device got here, I have to, the flow is here, I have to offload it. Regarding the connection tracking hook, that also makes sense to call down my opinion. Um, if this would be generalized, um, I think it's perfectly fine to add something like that to connection tracking, to query for live connections, to get uh, statistic updates, and that's basically all you need, I think. And, and the device stats thing that should be tied in with what Rupa was talking about, right? that's one of the things we talked about when you're doing hardware offloads, stats is one of the problems, and we have to figure out a way to get that data back in. So just like bridging, we have this hook, we're going to have the it's, contract hook too? Yeah. I mean, we should just build a generic hardware is going to give me some more information about this device hook. For the connection tracking, um, connection tracking offload, what is actually important is to find out if the connection is still alive or not. Sure. So by doing that, you, you will update the counters as well. And, um, yeah, push, but use the same method is what I'm saying. Yeah. I guess, I guess for us, we also have a switch device that we support in addition to this, uh, to this device. And one of the difficulties that we have is, from a software perspective, recognizing that if we accelerate a connection in the switch, which also has acceleration similar to what we do, we lose all of those contract stats. And that's by intention and by design for that switch. But being aware of that and knowing as an application, if I accelerate it there, I'm losing my per connection statistics. That's a very important thing. And it's something that we can't, uh, we can't really know today about the hardware. Right, do you want to lose your stats? Is that no, <laughs> no, I don't want to, but, but the point is, if I chose to accelerate in the switch, instead of choosing to accelerate in a system like this, I lose contract updates, so, I lose contract statistics. User space is no longer rational for those So what we do, our answer to that is we create a tap device and we put the stats there. Yeah, yeah, so sure, you still sure. have the ability to query the stats and user space knows they exist, it's just... Some devices don't container. do that. Yeah. yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are running low on time. Uh, any other questions for Matthew and Qualcomm? Okay, so moving on, uh, we're gonna have...